Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 1, where we see the prophet running from God. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Um, the, the name Jonah actually means dove. It's an interesting name. We don't see it very often. We do see it a couple of times, uh, both here and even in the New Testament. Um, the son of Amittai saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. That word great, uh, uh, ha'ir is the word for city, ha'ir ha'gadola. Um, that we're going to see a lot of greats in this book. It's going to be a book of superlatives. And we begin with Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it for their wickedness has come before me. Now, the city of Nineveh is located in Assyria on the banks of of the Tigris River. Um, uh, the kingdom of Assyria was located there. The kingdom of Assyria had been growing and growing and growing and getting bigger and bigger until eventually it would threaten to even take uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. It would come up against Judah. Uh, it would be stopped short there. That, that's a different story. We're not going to see that right now. But the kingdom of Assyria was the superpower in the world of that day. Now, now I say of that day, we're not told here in, in Jonah exactly when this story is taking place. Uh, at, at, there were times when the kingdom of Assyria got big, and there were times when it got smaller and then bigger again. Uh, the, the, um, the boundaries were not fixed uh, because it had no natural protection, and that meant that Assyria is eventually going to get quite big. Uh, we are given a hint as to when this might be taking place. When we look at 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25, this was in the days of Jeroboam II, and we read about Jeroboam II. Uh, he, was, he was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, not necessarily a good king as far as the Lord was concerned, because he had followed in the footsteps of his namesake, Jeroboam I. Now, Jeroboam I had been king uh, hundreds of years earlier and had been the king that had first led the northern kingdom of Israel into idolatry, not worshiping pagan gods, but trying to worship God through the use of, of idols and of golden calves and in different places than in Jerusalem. Well, Jeroboam II continued that same um, means and, and uh, attempt to worship God in that way. In fact, he, he seems to have escalated it. And we read that he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah. Uh, that is, he's actually extending the borders of Israel uh, larger than they had been previously, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah. This is the same Jonah the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gad-hefer. So uh, Jonah prophesied. He prophesied about things that took place in Jeroboam's day, which means he lived at least that early, maybe even a little bit earlier, I suppose. But we're not going to read so much about Jeroboam the second, but we are going to read about Assyria and one of its important cities, one of its chief cities, the city of Nineveh. Later on, Nineveh is actually going to become the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. I don't know if it was quite yet, but it was, and it's not going to be described as such, uh, we'll see the king of Nineveh, not the king of the Assyrian Empire. So maybe that's just a localized governor when we do read about him. Now, the Assyrians were renowned for their military machine. Um, they had perfected the art of not just siege warfare, where they would go around a city and starve it into submission, but of actually coming up against the city and tearing down its walls, not waiting until the people were starved out of existence, but actually breaking through. And they did break through using their archers, their, their slingers, their soldiers. Um, they had uh, mixed cadres of, of military might. But once they had come up against the city and actually captured it, then the real terror began. The Assyrians had invented, I don't know if they invented it, maybe it was around before, but they were, they were the ones that popularized it, uh, the, a form of various forms of torture, including impalement and crucifixion. Uh, if they, they would crucify some of their people, impale others, they would... Uh, uh, put their, their captives down on racks and begin pulling off skin and body parts. Uh, they would uh, put fish hooks through the cheeks or through the noses of, of some of their, their victims. And then others, they notice the, the heads that are gathered around that are detached from, uh, from the, uh, 
uh, bodies of their victims. And, and other peoples might have done this too. What made the Assyrians so distinct is they decorated the palaces of their, of their kings with these scenes. <laughs> um, the, I think of the Minoans who decorated their palaces with scene of, scenes of fish and farming and playing and, and sports. Uh, but no, the Assyrians decorated their palaces with scenes of grisly conquest and mutilation. And so they had made a name for themselves. Well, perhaps it's no surprise then, chapter 1 and verse 3, that Jonah rose up to flee Tarshish. Uh, he's going to flee to Tarshish. He's, instead of going to Nineveh, uh, we're going to see Tarshish is in the other direction. He, but he's fleeing from the presence of of the Lord. Now, it's not what it looks like. You see, I might have been tempted to flee because I would have wanted to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is a scary city. There's, there's big, bad Assyrians there. But we're going to find out when we get to chapter 4. Spoiler alert, I don't want to give it away, but I want you to note that he's fleeing, but not necessarily for the reason you might think. You might think he's afraid, and there's going to be some hints right here in chapter 1 that he, he's not particularly afraid. And so he goes from what he thinks is from the presence of the Lord. The way you say that in Hebrew is you say uh, from before his face, because after all, if you're not before my face, you're not in my presence. Uh, Apparently he's never read uh, Psalm 139, uh, the Psalm of David that says, who can flee from the presence of God, from the face of God? Nobody can. Uh, You can go to heaven and he's there. You can go to, to, to the grave and he's there. You can go under the sea and he's there. And Jonah's going to find this out in a very real way. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship. <laughs> Already you can tell Jonah is highly motivated because the Jew- Jewish people did not normally go on ships. <laughs> Anytime, anywhere in the Bible that you see a Jewish person getting into a boat, it's going to be problems, and it will be that way here as well. But he found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, again from the presence of the Lord. Tarshish was as far away as you could go in the known world. You know, the, um, the, the Jewish people hadn't been to like the, uh, the Americas or, or uh, to China or things like that. But there was a Syria, notice that was to the east of Israel. And he gets, goes down into a boat going west to the other side of the known world. Tarshish was thought to be, uh, most scholars think of it as, as Spain, you know, what we know of as Spain. They just called it Tarshish. Uh, and Jonah's going to go from the presence of God. Verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind. Now, when we see that, we're going to see a lot of greats. I already said that. We saw a great city. This is a great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea. So the ship was about to break up. Verse 5, then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea. Uh, when, when you're doing that, remember their, their whole reason for being on a ship was so they could take cargo from place to place. So if they throw it overboard, they're abandoning their reason for the entire voyage, but they'd rather live than, than lose, they'd rather uh, lose the cargo and live than to lose their lives. And so they're they're throwing the cargo, which was in the, in the ship, into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah, and here's the hint that Jonah's, he's, it's, it's not a fear factor. Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen sound asleep. Now, maybe you say, well, maybe he was seasick. But, but uh, when people are seasick, a lot of times they're not able to sleep. Um, Jonah, he goes to sleep. That doesn't sound like he's afraid. Maybe there's, it's a hint that he's fleeing for a different reason. Again, I'm not going to give it away now. We'll have to come back in chapter 4 and see why that is. Verse 6, so the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Um, and, and everyone there is calling to the different gods that are represented, which, which suggests to me maybe, maybe this is not a Jewish ship. Uh, like I said, Jews don't did normally go out to sea, but maybe it's a, a ship from a different culture that had put in at Tarsh, uh, at, uh, at Joppa, um, and, and Jonah has now taken passage. 
Next, the people on the ship, they cast lots, uh, seeking to find from one of the gods, because uh, many of them were worshiping different gods, or sometimes many gods, uh, but they cast lots to find out who has brought this calamity upon them, and the lot falls to Jonah. There's a passage over in the Proverbs that talk about how the lot is cast into the lap, but it's, uh, it's every device is from the Lord. Uh, it's not saying that you ought to cast lots in order to find God's will, but the God is even in control of chance happenings. Verse 8, then they said to him, tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country? They, they didn't necessarily know he was Jewish. Uh, from what people are you? And he now is going to explain who he is and his, his bona fides, and, and what has come about in bringing this storm. Verse 9, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven. Remember when you see the word Lord in all capital letters, that's the translator's way of telling you uh, that's the name of God, and they're, they're not repeating it because they don't, uh, first of all, they're not sure how to, how to transliterate it. Um, and some people think it's, it's pronounced Yahweh, or uh, the Old English was Jehovah, but there's actually no letter J in, in Hebrew, so that doesn't, that doesn't work very well. But notice, I fear the God of heaven, but that doesn't mean that he is only in heaven and only deals with things up there. Notice, who made the sea and the dry land. He's the God of everything, but he's the God who lives in heaven, uh, who that is his throne. Uh, the rest is sort of added on his foot, the earth is his footstool. Verse 10, then the, main, the men became extremely frightened. The way you say that in Hebrew, again, our old friend Gadol, uh, uh, greatly frightened. And they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. You know, what we had here was a short explanation. Uh, he gives them a longer explanation. Uh, that frequently happens, where you, you just hold a little bit of the dialogue. More dialogue took place. Um, uh, verse 11, so they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may, became, may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. It was, it was growing in intensity. Verse 12, he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. <laughs> then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on account of me, this great storm that's great again has come upon you. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. The sea suddenly calms down at their act of obedience. And then, then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows here they come to at least a measure of faith. They're not thanking their pagan gods. They're thanking the God who is, the God who is there, and the God in whose existence they have come now to believe. Verse 17, and the Lord appointed, <laughs> there it is, a great fish <laughs> to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter one ends on this note, but I want to point out several things. First of all, notice the, the great fish, the Dag Gadol. Um, there's our old friend Gadol again. Um, we're not told it was a whale. We're not told what kind of fish it is, apparently big enough to, to swallow a person. And there are a number of fish that can, that can do that. But I also want you to notice the contrast here between Jonah and when we get to the New Testament, we're going to see Jesus, who himself will bring up this contrast. You see, Jonah had been sent to Nineveh. Jesus was sent to planet Earth. Jonah tried to run away from God. In coming to Earth, Jesus was obedient to God, both in his birth and in his life, and even an obedience that led him to the cross. In Jonah, we have uh, the story of one who was asleep in the ship and when he was cast overboard, calmed the storm. Jesus also, there's a story about how he was asleep in a ship, not on the Mediterranean, but in his case, on the little tiny Sea of Galilee. Uh, and they didn't have to throw him overboard to, to accomplish it, but he also, with a word, calmed the storm. 
In Jonah's case, he was thrown overboard to save the sailors. In Jesus' case, he died upon the cross to save us. In Jonah's case, he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And in Jesus' case, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the grave, where he had been placed after his death. In Jonah's case, his disobedience had brought the storm on the sailors. In Jesus' case, the obedience of Jesus brings salvation to us. But, but we must do the same thing that the the sailors did. We must believe. We must trust in Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior. And then we will find that he hasn't been thrown overboard, that he is still with us because he has risen from the dead. As Jonah came forth from the fish, we'll see that next time. Uh, So Jesus came forth from the grave and lives today with us.